take a drive through the back roads of rural America, you're bound to pass any number of boxy white trailers. These unremarkable 250 square foot homes are part of the forgotten legacy of Hurricane Katrina. Minimum wage where I come from in Indianapolis is $7.25 an hour. Minimum wage here is roughly $14 to $15 an hour. Even working as a cashier at Walmart, you're going to earn $16, $17, $18 an hour. So, Do you hear about the formaldehyde issues at all? I'm, I'm sorry? Do you hear about the formaldehyde issues at all? I haven't heard about anything. Um... But I'd be happy to <laughs> run a, a free test for you if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to know if the place where I'm living is poisonous. <laughs> Ten years ago, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita tore into the Gulf Coast and displaced over a million people. In response, the Federal Emergency Management Agency deployed over 120,000 trailers to the region. After Katrina, it was pandemonium. People were clamoring for these trailers. There were protests about how slow they were getting deployed, and people wanted a place to live. There were so many bare necessities that were problems that the FEMA trailers having some sort of strange air to them was just one of many things that were going on. When people first moved in, they experienced symptoms such as eye irritation, headaches, and nosebleeds. And as time progressed, health effects worsened. Some people suffered ailments including spikes in asthma, rashes, chronic diarrhea, and cognitive decline. As the scale of exposure became apparent, a class action lawsuit was launched. And by 2007, FEMA was aggressively taking back the trailers. And the court mandated that FEMA keep these trailers as evidence. And that court order expired on January 1st, 2010. So that's the date when they were able to cut their losses. They were spending tens of millions of dollars a year to maintain the lots. They took the first opportunity to sell them on the open market. So they were sold in giant auctions. They were sold very cheap, often in large lots. This research has taken me to over a dozen states. People have emailed and called me from every corner of the country. And many of them weren't even sure whether or not they had a FEMA trailer. So I would run their VIN numbers through a list of every trailer FEMA sold. Everyone thought the formaldehyde levels of these trailers would have gone down much quicker than they did. FEMA, the trailer industry, resellers. But six, seven years after Katrina, I was testing trailers all over the country and I found levels were still quite high and people were still getting sick. Florida, North Carolina, Louisiana, Louisiana. Every week California, I was getting Michigan. emails or phone calls from very concerned people. North Dakota, Louisiana, Tennessee, up here in Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Dakota again. I just purchased the camper here in the Bakken. Housing is all but impossible to find. My daughter, who is sick, has been hospitalized numerous times with breathing problems and was even ambulanced out before because of respiratory problems. Many of the trailers gravitated to foreclosure hotspots. 2010 was the peak of the foreclosure crisis. They went to pockets of rural poverty all over the country, including Native American reservations with chronic housing shortages. But nowhere seemed to attract these trailers like North Dakota. Their oil boom was taking off just as the economy was tanking, and people were flocking to the state for work. Demand for housing grew exponentially. It was more expensive than Manhattan. So here we are at the Tumbleweed Inn, which comes highly recommended. gonna drop off our, well, <laughs> here we have some FEMA trailers right here. We've got a, a park model. Um, this is the Gulfstream Cavalier, which is the most 
uh, high, the highest production unit of the FEMA trailers. We've got one, two of those. Uh, another FEMA trailer here. Looks like we have about seven over there. Um, we're about two minutes into our adventure and we've already found basically a FEMA trailer park. We've got another one here. This is a park unit, another park unit behind there. Another uh, travel trailer, FEMA travel trailer back there. You can identify them by the make and model uh, and, I can, and by the VIN number, which will run all the VIN numbers in a second. Um, but most of all, you can just see them by being the, the plainest, um, least branding, no um, garnishes like these swooping lines or mountains. Um, these two are Gulf Stream Cavaliers. Oh, here's another one. So there's three down here. That one has a busted window. Looks like people are home in most of them. We'll drop off our gear and say hi. And when I came in my hair, I was like, man, this is like back at home. Not the scenery, but like back at home, the trailers, you know? Back at home, just more money. So I just kind of, I'm used to it. I'm used to it. Were you surprised when you saw me like, hey, I know these trailers? Yeah, I yeah. was. I was like, dang. I just came from this trailer. <laughs> I'm like, back in it, huh? They got mold right here, mold right here, mold right here. It's not meant for weather. Nobody wants to live with this. Who wants to live with that? Not the people around here that's working. Heard that there's a job out here, so I was like, hell yeah, I'm down to go. Like $16 an hour for cash registry, that ain't nothing. Yeah, you'll never find that out in California. It's a little overpriced, but it's whatever. Yeah, how much is it? Like 12 something a month. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty, it's the oil field, you know? Yeah. A lot of, they're making money, so they make everybody pay. How many of you are here? There's about seven people. Seven people here? Yeah, well, two right there, two right here, bunk bed, and me right there. The federal government built it for people displaced by the hurricane when their home got destroyed by the hurricane. Yeah. And they built it, and then they found out they were toxic, and then they sold them all over the country. That's the best way to get rid of a toxic thing, you know, just to sell it around the country. They had a sticker in the window saying not to be used as housing. And then... Uh, I'm here. Yeah, now I'm here. Like, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. But I think, actually, since you don't have a window here, you're getting good, clean air in there. Yeah. There's people that have it like sealed up with these, these tape oh, and stuff, yeah. like it's getting bottled up in there. So, actually, there's a uh, there's FEMA trailers down there. Yeah, there's like, at least two or three. Yeah, it's pretty tight in there. It's not really, <laughs> I mean, nobody likes being here. I, I don't like being in these trailers. It's, it's just like not actually cool at all. <laughs> yeah. There are like three more in there, like three and then plus me and my dad. This is not that we want to live, like want us, you know, live like this, like all tied up and stuff like that. But that's what the whole plan of this is. All together, we actually end up paying just like a hundred bucks each which saves us a lot of money. So one of the reasons why we knocked on your door in particular is that this looks like it's uh, a former FEMA trailer. So a trailer that was made by the federal government um, in 2005 or 2006 for people on the Gulf Coast um, after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Um, mm, that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting because the guy who sold us that is exactly that year, 2005. Well, we can look up the VIN number and see if it was from there. Would you be interested in? We could try. I really wouldn't know. We exactly you. wouldn't know where it is. Sure. Yeah, I'll show you. Sure. Here it is, right, right there. So it's barely legible. So since it was potentially made by the federal government, you can just ask the federal government for records, because it's public public records of all of the VIN numbers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna search 
And see, it's taking forever because there's 150,000 of these they're scrolling through. Yeah. So it's just taking them. So this is actually okay. the same VIN number, so this is the same trailer. So this trailer... A 2006 Recreation by Design travel trailer. And it was sold in a lot of 21,715 similar trailers for Henderson Auctions. There's a big auction house in Louisiana. Oh. And that's who it was sold to. So it must have been sold by the federal government to this auctioneer. The auctioneer sold it to someone who sold it to the guy your dad bought it from. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Originally, this was going to be a summer job for me. I decided to keep staying because I did not save any of my money. <laughs> So what I'll be doing is um, pulling formaldehyde at a known rate through this tube that I'm gonna, I'm gonna score and then break off the tips. And there's a chemical in there that reacts with the formaldehyde in a known way. Okay. So I'll pull it for half an hour. Hopefully the results are not worrisome. They're not too bad. They're not, you know, incredible. Uh, it's about 20 parts per billion, um, which is... What's the, what's the danger zone? Can you put it in perspective for me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. It's 20! <laughs> there you go, bye. Uh, so, a lot of the trailers I was testing uh, back in 2011, 2012 were hitting, like, upwards of 100, 100 parts per billion. Okay. And so this is 20, so it's about a fifth of that. And a lot of these units in particular were hitting about 100. So it's about five times better than it was. And okay. it's maybe around double a normal home right now. Okay. Um, Every home that's built has formaldehyde in it. So it's part of something we live with all the time. Okay. Um, so we know what levels are really, really bad and what should be um, avoided in occupational settings. When it comes to domestic exposure that's over a very long period of time and for at a relatively low level, the effects aren't no, as well known. So the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is a sister agency of CDC, uh, which you may have heard of, um, they say that below eight parts per billion uh, for a long term, like over a year exposure, um, you don't have to worry about negative health effects. So, but over eight, you could have effects they haven't necessarily found harm happening at nine parts per billion or ten parts per billion, but they have to be a little extra careful in protecting the population by saying below eight. You'll, you'll definitely be safe. I'm living at 20 parts per billion. Is there anything I should be looking out for, or at least a downgraded version of the symptom anywhere in the future? Uh, yeah, if, if you did have, um, like, slowing thinking, like if you're hypocognition, so like thinking more slowly. Okay. Um, issues with your respiratory tract, um, sort of like a simmering, low qual, like low grade sinus infection. If you have asthma, increased asthma attacks. Um, but the, the thing also is that some people are gonna react and some people aren't. So it's not just a matter of when it's gonna happen to you, it could just be that it's not going to happen. We thought that we'd find some trailers, but we had no idea that we'd find them in basically in post-Katrina concentrations. Um, there's one out back of the restaurant we're at now. There's a, two minutes down the road, there's a trailer park with at least 20, 20 to 30. They're really every single little cluster of trailers that we've seen, at least one has been a FEMA trailer. We also thought we'd find oil and gas men living in these trailers, but instead it's been almost exclusively really young men working on the fringes of the boom in the service industry. We're on our way to meet with Delvin Cree on trust land of the Turtle Mountain Reservation about three hours northeast of the Bakken Shale. I've been trying to get in touch with Delvin for at least three years because he's the most outspoken person about the hazards Native Americans have endured living in these trailers. Uh, 
I think we got like 800 to 850 of these camper trailers. And we, we were getting them until I raised the concern about the toxic mold in them and uh, the formaldehyde levels. And I tried, did stop getting them because of that. I think that's why the government gave us these, tra these camper trailers because we can dispose of them, dispose of them on our own lands. So. But in essence, they're disposing of them by giving them to you. Yep. A lot of these campers were going out to the Bakken oil fields and they were being sold. And uh, that was a concern of mine also. Each camper that I seen in uh, Mississippi had them stickers on them that you couldn't live in them, that they were temporary housing. And when they got up here, all them stickers were gone. Were you aware that it was a FEMA unit when you when you purchased it? I kind of thought it was, but they weren't being advertised as being that. You know, I mean, it was great. Now I bought and I got my money invested in a house, and the house is making me sick. You know. How you doing, huh? Uh, sometimes you know it was just you were having a runny nose for no apparent reason. You know, whether it was an allergy or whether it was, it almost felt like you had a cold coming on, but it never manifested itself as a cold, you know. Sleepless nights, uh, toss and turn, toss and turn. Uh, that's gotten a lot better now. I mean, a lot of times I'll sleep six, seven hours that's straight through, you know. Uh, obviously, when it was 40 parts per billion, it was affecting me, but now it's 30 parts per billion, I'm not noticing any real problems and uh, uh, but who's to say maybe even at 30 parts per billion that could cause somebody else health concerns we can't say that Greg's house is safe uh, the level is still higher than what I would want to live in it's also certainly several times higher than the cancer risk level so even if he's feeling better on a day-to-day -day level he may have some latent toxicity that could affect his health in the future. So the toxicity that Greg is dealing with now is no longer the extraordinary toxicity that was relegated to those kinds of homes, but the everyday sort of toxicity that we all have to deal with since all our homes are held together with these same materials. If you're an unskilled or slightly skilled worker and you can make over $100,000 a year, you're probably capable of putting yourself through a lot to make it all make sense to you. But for the people we've been talking to, who have mostly been service industry folks, where they're making maybe $10 an hour more than they would, they're also paying higher rent than they would, living in worse conditions than they would, more isolated than they would. Is it really worth it at the end of the day?